Chapter Four of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Six, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Four: Mediation Declined. After the failure of his overture for joint mediation, and after the unqualified utterances of the United States against such measures, it might seem singular that the Emperor of the French should not have recognized the uselessness of similar attempts. Mr. Seward, after the rejection of the French overtures by England and Russia, treated the matter in a brief and dignified note to Mr. Dayton, in which he declined to discuss the subject at any length such a debate upon a subject which has already lost its practical character or which to speak more accurately has not attained such a character may produce irritations and jealousies which the president desires to avoid yet at the risk of exciting just such irritations and jealousies the emperor again sought to approach the government of the united states alone with a message which he had already been informed would have been rejected if brought by all the great powers of europe jointly Drouin de la Hue addressed a dispatch to Monsieur Mercier, the French minister in Washington, on the ninth of January, 1863, in which, while he refers to the little success of former overtures, he says that the government of the emperor has seriously examined the objections which have been made to us when we have suggested the idea of a friendly mediation, and we have asked ourselves whether they are truly of a nature to set aside as premature every tentative to a reconciliation. He was not aware of the repugnance of the United States to an intervention of foreign powers, nor of the hope which, as he says, the federal government has not abandoned, of obtaining a solution by force of arms. But amid all the courteous forms in which his expression is wrapped, it is evident he thinks that repugnance is unreasonable and that hope fallacious. He reminded the government of the United States of the conferences which preceded the acknowledgment of their independence by Great Britain, and continued, in a paragraph which we will give without abridgment, to set forth a proposition which was little less than that of the surrender of the national authority. Nothing, therefore, would hinder the government of the United States without renouncing the advantage which it believes it can attain by the continuation of the war from entering upon informal conferences with the confederates of the south in case they should show themselves disposed thereto representatives or commissioners of the two parties could assemble at such point as it should be deemed proper to designate and which could for this purpose be declared neutral reciprocal complaints would be examined into at this meeting in place of the accusations which north and south mutually cast upon each other at this time would be substituted an argumentative discussion of the interests which divide them. They would seek out by means of well-ordered and profound deliberations whether these interests are definitely irreconcilable, whether separation is an extreme which can no longer be avoided, or whether the memories of a common existence, whether the ties of every kind which have made of the North and of the South one sole and whole federative state, and have borne them on to such a high degree of prosperity, are not more powerful than the causes which have placed arms in the hands of the two populations. A negotiation, the object of which would be thus determinate, would not involve any of the objections raised against the diplomatic intervention of Europe, and, without giving birth to the same hopes as the intermediate conclusion of an armistice, would exercise a happy influence on the march of events. This overture of mediation was received on the 3rd of February, and was answered by Mr. Seward under the President's instructions, only three days later. It was a dark period of the war, between Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. There was much in the attitude of veiled hostility of European powers to discourage and depress, but the statesmen charged with the welfare of the Republic met this insidious attack, as they met all others, with unshakable courage and fortitude. The reply of Mr. Seward to the French overture of mediation was one of the most important state papers written during the war. He referred in the beginning to the language used by Durand de Hoy in regard to the protraction of the struggle and the hopes of the federal government. 
these passages he says seem to me to do unintentional injustice to the language whether confidential or public in which the government has constantly spoken on the subject of the war it certainly has had and avowed only one purpose a determination to preserve the integrity of the country so far from admitting any laxity of effort or betraying any despondency the government has on the contrary borne itself cheerfully in all vicissitudes with unwavering confidence in an early and complete triumph of the national cause now when we are in a manner invited by a friendly power to review the twenty-one months history of the conflict we find no occasion to abate that confidence through such an altercation of victories and defeats as is the appointed incident of every war the land and naval forces of the united states have steadily advanced reclaiming from the insurgents the ports forts and posts which they had treacherously seized before strife actually began and even before it was seriously apprehended so many of the states and districts which the insurgents included in the field of their projected exclusive slaveholding dominions have already been re-established under the flag of the union that they now retain only the states of georgia alabama and texas with half of virginia half of north carolina and two-thirds of south carolina half of mississippi and one-third respectively of arkansas and louisiana the national forces hold even this small territory in close blockade and siege this government if required does not hesitate to submit its achievements to the test of comparison and it maintains that in no part of the world and in no times ancient or modern has a nation when rendered all unready for combat by the enjoyment of eighty years of almost unbroken peace so quickly awakened at the alarm of sedition put forth energies so vigorous and achieved successes so signal and effective as those which have marked the progress of this contest on the part of the union mr seward then goes on to say that he fears m durand de la hue has taken other light than the correspondence of this government for his guidance in ascertaining its temper and firmness he has been misled by the freedom of opposition and criticism allowed by our laws and customs but he reminds him that not one voice has been raised anywhere out of the immediate field of the insurrection in favor of foreign intervention of mediation of arbitration or of compromise with the relinquishment of one acre of the national domain or the surrender of even one constitutional franchise at the same time it is manifest to the world that our resources are yet abundant and our credit adequate to the exacting emergency in answer to durand de la hue's suggestion that the government shall appoint commissioners to meet on neutral ground commissioners of the insurgents and to arrange with them a basis of agreement he says that this amounts to nothing less than a proposition that while this government is engaged in suppressing an armed insurrection with the purpose of maintaining the constitutional national authority and preserving the integrity of the country it shall enter into diplomatic discussions with the insurgents upon questions whether that authority shall not be renounced and whether the country shall not be delivered over to disunion to be quickly followed by an ever-increasing anarchy mr seward replied that even if it were possible for the government of the united states to compromise the national authority so far as to enter into any such debates no good results could flow from them the insurgent leaders would never consent to forego the ambition that has impelled them to the disloyal position they are occupying the loyal people of the south would be unheard in any such discussion and any offer of peace by the government on the condition of the maintenance of the union must necessarily be rejected on the other hand as i have already intimated this government has not the least thought of relinquishing the trust which has been confided to it by the nation under the most solemn of all political sanctions and if it had any such thought it would still have abundant reasons to know that peace proposed at the cost of dissolution would be immediately unreservedly and indignantly rejected by the american people it is a great mistake that european statesmen make if they suppose this people are demoralized whatever in the case of an insurrection the people of france or of great britain or of switzerland or of the netherlands would do to save their national existence no matter how the strife might be regarded by 
or might affect foreign nations just so much and certainly no less the people of the united states will do if necessary to save for the common benefit the region which is bounded by the pacific and the atlantic coasts and by the shores of the gulf of st lawrence and mexico together with the free and common navigation of the natural highways by which this land which to them is at once a land of inheritance and a land of promise is opened and watered even if the agents of the american people now exercising their power should through fear or faction fall below this height of the national virtue they would be speedily yet constitutionally replaced by others of sterner character and patriotism mr seward objects to the use of the phrase north and south to describe the parties in conflict there is an insurrectionary party confined to a restricted region while the loyal people embrace not only northern states but also eastern middle western and southern states in reply to Durand de la Hue's citation of the conferences that preceded the peace between the colonies and great britain he says that action in the crisis of a nation must accord with its necessities great britain when entering on negotiations had manifestly come to entertain doubts of her ultimate success and it is certain that the councils of the colonies could not fail to take new courage if not to gain other advantages when the parent state compromised so far as to treat of peace on the terms of conceding their independence it is true indeed that peace must come at some time and that conferences must attend if they are not allowed to proceed the pacification there is, however, a better form for such conferences than the one which M. Durand de la Hues suggests. The latter would be palpably in derogation of the Constitution of the United States, and would carry no weight because destitute of the sanction necessary to bind either the disloyal or the loyal portions of the people. On the other hand, the Congress of the United States furnishes a constitutional form for debates between the alienated parties senators and representatives from the loyal portion of the people are there already fully empowered to confer and seats also are vacant and inviting senators and representatives of the discontented party who may be constitutionally sent there from the states involved in the insurrection moreover the conferences which can thus be held in congress have this great advantage over any that could be organized upon the plan of m durand de la Hues, namely that the congress if it were thought wise, could call a national convention to adopt its recommendations and give them all the solemnity and binding force of organic law. Such conferences between the alienated parties may be said to have already begun. Maryland, Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Missouri, states which are claimed by the insurgents, are already represented in Congress, and submitting with perfect freedom and in a proper spirit their advice upon the course best calculated to bring about in the shortest time a firm lasting and honorable peace representatives have been also sent from louisiana and others are understood to be coming from arkansas there is a preponderating argument mr seward said in concluding this unanswerable dispatch in favor of the congressional form of conference over that which is suggested by m durand de la Hues, namely that while an accession to the latter would bring this government into a concurrence with the insurgents in disregarding and setting aside an important part of the constitution of the united states and so would be a pernicious example the congressional conference on the contrary preserves and gives new strength to that sacred writing which must continue through future ages the sheet anchor of the republic we find in the manuscript archives of the confederate department of state some curious facts which go far to explain the apparently stupid persistence of the emperor of france in this scheme of mediation mr slittle gives an account of a long and intimate conversation with the emperor held on the sixteenth of july eighteen sixty two in which the emperor spoke with great satisfaction of the defeat of mcclellan before richmond and of mr lincoln's call for additional troops as evidence of his conviction of the desperate character of the struggle in which he was engaged the emperor said that although it was unquestionably for the interests of france that the united states should be a powerful and united people to act as contrepods to the maritime power of england yet his sympathies had always been with the south 
whose people were struggling for the principle of self-government, of which he was a firm and consistent advocate. But he had always considered the re-establishment of the Union impossible, and final separation a mere question of time. But the difficulty was to find a way to give effect to his sympathies, that in so grave a question he had not been willing to act without the cooperation of England, which he had not as yet been able to secure. He thought England wished him to draw the chestnuts from the fire. Mr. Slittle, in a strong plea in favor of the recognition of the Confederacy by France, said that it would be the safest and most efficacious means of establishing the independence of the South. He played, with great skill, upon the Emperor's special weaknesses, assuring him that England would follow wherever he led, that the United States had no naval power which could stand for a moment against his ironclad ships that the safety of Maximilian in Mexico depended upon the triumph of the South, and at length, appealing directly to his cupidity, he offered him a large pecuniary inducement, either to break the blockade or to recognize the Confederacy at his choice. Mr. Slittle had been authorized by a confidential dispatch from Mr. Benjamin to make this astonishing proposition. With an instinctive conviction that an appeal to the most sordid motives would be more likely to be favorably received at Tuileries than in Downing Street. The Confederate government ordered Mr. Slittle to sound the Emperor to ascertain whether he was so bound up by his engagements with England as to be entirely precluded from independent action. In the exceptional position which we now occupy, said Mr. Benjamin, struggling for existence against an enemy whose vastly superior resources for obtaining the material of war place us at great disadvantage, it becomes of primary importance to neglect no means of opening our ports. It is well understood, he went on to say, that there exists at present a temporary embarrassment in the finances of France, which might have the effect of deterring that government from initiating a policy likely to superinduce the necessity for naval expeditions. If under these circumstances you should, after cautious inquiry, be able to satisfy yourself that the grant of a subsidy for defraying the expenses of such expeditions would suffice for removing any obstacles to an arrangement or understanding with the Emperor, you are at liberty to enter into engagements to that effect. In such event the agreement would take the form most advantageous to this country, by stipulation to deliver on this side a certain number of bales of cotton to be received by the merchant vessels of France at certain designated points. In this manner, 100,000 bales of cotton at 500 pounds each, costing this government but $4,500,000, would represent a grant to France of not less than $12,500,000, or 63 million francs. Such sum would maintain afloat a considerable fleet for a length of time quite sufficient to open the Atlantic and Gulf ports to the commerce of France. He authorized Slittle further to couple with this proposition for a direct subsidy the free importation of goods to be brought into the Confederacy by the vessels which were to take the cotton to Europe. He estimated that the profits of those cargoes and the proceeds of the cotton altogether would scarcely fall short of 100 million francs. Excited by the contemplation of these ciphers almost to the point of intoxication, Judah P. Benjamin proceeds. On this basis you will readily perceive the extent to which the finances of France might find immediate and permanent relief if the subsidy were doubled, and the enormous advantage which would accrue to that government if, by thus opening one or more of the southern ports to its own commerce, the interchange of commodities should absorb half a million or a million of bales. This proposition, Mr. Slittle, says the Emperor received in a manner which showed that it was not disagreeable to him. He asked some questions as to how the cotton was to be obtained, to which Mr. Slittle, of course, replied that His Majesty could manage that with his fleet. Mr. Benjamin had expressly authorized Mr. Slittle to use, in his discretion, the same means to procure the recognition of the Confederacy which he was empowered to use to induce France to raise the blockade. It is hardly to be doubted that the representations of the Confederate envoy had more or less effect on the mind of the Emperor in bringing about the decision to which he came in the autumn of attempting to organize his joint overture for peace to the United States. Mr. Slittle had another long and important conversation with the Emperor on the 28th of October. 
the interview was marked with the same expression of mutual sympathy as the preceding one mr slittle was confident of early and important confederate victories of disaffection and counter-revolution in the north the emperor again had no scruple in declaring that his sympathies were entirely with the south but that he was obliged to act with great caution and intimated that if he acted alone england instead of following his example would endeavor to embroil him with the united states and that french commerce would thus be destroyed mr slittle tried to convince him that recognition on his part would be absolutely safe that the american navy would be swept from the ocean and the northern ports blockaded by a moiety of the french marine that the glory or the normandy could enter the harbors of new york or boston and lay these cities under contribution that mad and stupid as the washington government had shown itself to be it still had sense enough not to seek a quarrel with the first power of the world the emperor then asked mr slittle what he thought of a joint mediation from france england and russia whether it would if proposed be accepted by the two parties mr slittle told him that the north would probably accept it but he could not venture to say how it would be received at richmond mr slittle intimating his belief that england would not join in such an overture the emperor said he had reason to suppose the contrary that he had a letter from the king of the belgians which he would show me he did so it was an autograph letter from king leopold to the emperor dated brussels fifteenth october the date is important as queen victoria was then at brussels the king urges in the warmest manner for the cause of humanity and in the interests of the suffering populations of europe that prompt and strenuous efforts should be made by france england and russia to put an end to the bloody war that now desolates america he expresses his perfect conviction that all attempts to reconstruct the union of the united states are hopeless that final separation is an accomplished fact and that it is the duty of the great powers so to treat it that recognition or any other course that might be thought best calculated to bring about a peace should be at once adopted the appeal is made with great earnestness to the emperor to bring the whole weight of his great name and authority to bear on the most important question of his day it is universally believed that king leopold's counsels have more influence with queen victoria than those of any living man that in this respect he has inherited the succession of the late prince consort whether it be that this interview fixed the wandering mind of the emperor or whether he was amusing himself by getting the opinion of mr slittle in relation to a matter already determined it is at all events noteworthy that his proposition to the courts of england and russia for the mediation of the affairs in the united states was dated on the thirtieth of october two days after this conversation it was in this same interview that the emperor proposed that mr slittle should build ships for the confederate navy in france and mr slittle in turn offered the emperor on behalf of the confederacy all possible assistance in mexico and the west indies he might take as many islands and provinces as he liked a modified temptation of the mountain it is the common lot of traitors to suffer from treachery yet both parties to this interview doubtless felt afterwards that they had reason to complain of the way they were treated and mr slittle when the emperor repudiated his professions made in this interview probably felt no keener pang of confidence betrayed than did the emperor himself when in spite of the assurances of his royal brother of belgium the courts of england and russia flatly refused to join in his mission of mediation and in spite of the opinion of his louisiana friend that the north was really anxious for foreign intervention he received from mr lincoln a rebuff as galling as it was courteous and dignified this ended the discussion of the mediation of foreign powers in our affairs as between our government and those of the european states there was in fact no common ground between them the cabinets of the old world approached the subject with the conviction that the restoration of the national authority was impossible a hypothesis which mr lincoln and mr seward never permitted for a moment to find entrance into their hearts or minds it was alike repugnant to their feelings and their reason and the course of events gave a full justification to their courage and their wisdom it is after all not greatly to be wondered at that the european courts should have been deceived in regard to the attitude of the government of the united states 
and the prospect of its success in the contest with the rebellion the french minister in washington m Monsieur Monsieur, a diplomatist of ability and experience was personally so devoted an adherent of napoleon the third that his only point of view of public matters was in reference to their effect upon the fortunes or the plans of the emperor he was not unaware that the complete triumph of the national arms was regarded in paris as a contingency grossly improbable and also if it could be accomplished unfavorable to the perpetuity of a latin empire on this continent his sympathies and with them his beliefs were therefore wholly on the side of the south his intimate associations in this country were either with secessionists or with the most pronounced members of the opposition whose sentiments were hardly to be distinguished from those of the insurgents he naturally reported what he heard and what he believed and what he thought would be agreeable to the emperor and it would have been strange indeed if the latter had not been misled an incident which happened in the latter part of eighteen sixty two had a tendency to confirm his impression that the national government was losing its confidence and its firmness and that the republican party was not so united in its support as appeared on the surface horace greeley personally and by letter approached him with a suggestion that he should secure the mediation of the french government to put an end to the war m mercier having no personal acquaintance with mr greeley knew nothing of those peculiarities of caprice and impulse which form the special weakness of that remarkable character he saw in him only the most prominent and most powerful of american journalists and took it for granted that he represented in his anxiety for peace if not the administration itself at least the republican party of new york he communicated the letter to his colleagues as a matter of grave importance symptomatic of the weakness of the radical war party of the north he was greatly surprised by the severe admonition which he received from mr seward for his share in the affair and doubtless thought that the journalist more honestly represented the prevailing opinion than the premier he made a journey to richmond by the order of his government and he gave so warm a coloring to the permission accorded to his journey by the federal government in his report of the transaction that mr seward thought proper to say in a letter to the senate that he had never given a foreign minister or anybody else authority to make representations of any sort to the rebel government a letter written by lord lyons the british minister to his government in the autumn of eighteen sixty two shows how hostile to the administration of mr lincoln was the tone of feeling in the diplomatic body at that time and how persistently european cabinets were misinformed by their representatives in washington in reference to the situation and prospect of affairs in the united states on his arrival in new york after a visit to england he had been met and at once taken possession of by the leaders of the peace party who were also at that time among the leaders in fashionable society in new york he apparently adopts their point of view in some respects but sees the folly and doubts the sincerity of their pretenses that an armistice which they ardently desire would result in a restoration of the union the more sagacious members of the party he says must look upon the proposal of a convention merely as a last experiment to test the possibility of reunion they are no doubt well aware that the most probable consequences of an armistice would be the establishment of southern independence but they perceive that if the south is so utterly alienated that no possible concession will induce it to return voluntarily to the union it is wiser to agree a separation than to prosecute a cruel and hopeless war singularly enough lord lyons's conferences with the opposition in new york whose advice was given in a sense hostile to the government and to the prosecution of the war resulted in a report unfavorable to the project of mediation which was being so earnestly pressed by the enemies of the national cause in paris he quoted the conservative leaders as saying that an offer of mediation if made to the radical administration would be rejected and that it might increase the virulence with which the war was prosecuted if their own party were in power or virtually controlled the administration they would rather if possible obtain an armistice without the aid of foreign governments they were especially timid about the political effect of an offer of mediation which should come from great britain lord lyons therefore advised against such an offer on the ground that 
it might embarrass the peace party and thus oblige them in order to maintain their popularity to make some declaration against it it is not the least significant feature of this curious letter that lord lyons says at washington i have had fewer opportunities than i had at new york of ascertaining the present views of the chiefs of political parties at the interviews he had on arriving with mr seward and the president they both conversed only on ordinary topics and did not appear to expect or to desire from him any special communications from her majesty's government he missed in the responsible rulers of the nation and in the executive and legislative functionaries in whose hands rested the welfare of the country that open and effusive freedom of communication which he found among the sympathizers with succession in the drawing-rooms of new york in advising his government against an offer of mediation he repeated and adopted as his own the opinion he gained among the conservatives of new york that the president had thrown himself into the arms of the extreme radical party his statement of the aims of that party was not altogether inaccurate they declare that there is no hope of reconciliation with the southern people that the war must be pursued per fas et nefas until the disloyal men of the south are ruined and subjugated if not exterminated that not an inch of the old territory of the republic must be given up and that the foreign intervention in any shape must be rejected and resented lord lyons had no right to say that there was no hope of reconciliation with the southern people it was the southern leaders of the rebellion alone who were regarded by mr lincoln as irreconcilable and it was a gratuitous insult to the government to which he was accredited to say that they were determined to pursue the war per fas et nefas his imputation to the president of revengeful purposes towards the disloyal is false and unjustifiable with these exceptions his statement may pass as sufficiently expressing the intention of the government to save the union intact and to continue the war to triumph of the national cause lord lyons indicates that he has no faith whatever in such an issue of the conflict if he was wrong in his opinion he was also inexcusably wrong in the assumed facts on which it was based for he informs his government that on the fourth of next march the democrats will obtain control of the new house of representatives that the new congress will be hostile to the administration and to the radical party and that the president will hardly be able to persist in his present policy and in his assumption of extraordinary powers ten minutes perusal of a newspaper containing a list of congressmen elect would have enabled him to avoid so flagrant an error but any lesser lapses seem pardonable in comparison with the stupendous error of a minister charged with the most solemn responsibilities between two great and friendly powers and possessed of unlimited faculties for ascertaining the truth saying as lord lyons says near the close of his letter all hope of the reconciliation of the union appears to be fading away even from the minds of those who most desire it from the beginning of the war the executive department of the government had in a thousand ways continually repeated its determination to listen to no overtures from the insurgents not based upon a recognition of the national authority and no overtures from foreign powers of any nature whatever having reference to the rebellion and just before the succession ended it was thought by congress proper that the legislative body should express itself on the subject with equal clearness resolutions were introduced and passed through both houses of congress by very large majorities acknowledging the friendly form and intention of the overtures made by foreign powers in the direction of mediation and saying that if the idea of mediation should continue to be regarded as practicable it might lead to proceedings tending to embarrass the friendly relations between the united states and foreign powers and that to remove for the future all chance of misunderstanding on the subject it seems fit that congress should declare its convictions thereon the resolutions following this preamble were at once a declaration of the attitude of the united states and a formal warning to all foreign powers that their intervention was not desired and would not be entertained they expressed the deep regret of the american people that the blow aimed by the rebellion at the national life has fallen so heavily upon the laboring population of europe but that any proposition from any foreign power having for its object the arrest of the efforts of the united states to suppress the rebellion is calculated to prolong and embitter the conflict to cause increased expenditure of blood and treasure and to postpone the much-desired day of peace, 
and that Congress would look upon any further attempt in the same direction as an unfriendly act. The resolutions further expressed the disappointment of Congress at the hospitality and encouragement which a rebellious government, founded upon slavery as its cornerstone, had received from foreign powers, and they closed with the announcement that the war would be vigorously prosecuted according to the humane principles of Christian states until the rebellion should be suppressed. The President was requested to transmit a copy of these resolutions to the ministers of the United States in foreign countries, to be by them communicated to the governments to which they were accredited. End of chapter 4